Our next speaker is Andy Clark, who doesn't really need an introduction, and he's going to be talking about what extended me knows. Thank you. Okay, cool. So, um, thanks for letting me talk to, uh, to epistemologists. It will, it will soon become clear, but I don't really know much about epistemology. So, all I'm going to try and do is um, avoid what I think could be a tension between certain sort of um, currents in virtue epistemology and the whole idea of extended cognition. So my worry is that there might be something in, in sort of virtue epistemology demands on knowledge that would actually undermine the idea that we had uh, an extended cognitive system. So that's the thing I'm worried about and want to try and fiddle about with. Okay. So the backdrop to this is just the idea, uh, sort of extended mind sort of idea. Which I think is uh, just that minds like ours are works in progress and can be upgraded by uh, new stuff, new tools, new technologies. Um, there's a couple of questions then, you know. Uh, if we are open to cognitive upgrades, what does that tell us about human knowledge, if anything? Do extended minds imply extended nerves? And alternatively, might there be constraints on knowledge that undermine the idea that minds can be extended? So that's a real thing that I'm, I'm worried about and I'll um, try and bring into focus. So the plan is, I'm going to say a bit about extended minds, but actually, it'll turn out that mostly what I'm talking about are entangled systems. So that for the purposes of this talk, I'm not really going to be caring much about whether minds are extended. What I'm going to care about is whether, um, whether our abilities to, to generate knowledge states are actually deeply entangled with stuff that isn't, um, isn't biological. I'm going to point out that there might be a, an issue here for some forms of virtuous extension. Say something about my current sort of baby, which is predictive processing, and how that stuff might feed into this as a kind of second order reliabilism. And end up by trying to say something about the big fish that I think is sort of, sort of um, floating, I suppose, around here in an ugly kind of way. Um, stuff, about, uh, stuff about what reflection does for us, if anything. So, you know, the, a sort of general thrust of my comments will be that reflection could be a bad thing for extended cognition. Uh, and so uh, I'll have to say something in the end about uh, what it might do for us. So, okay. I guess to get that going, I need to just say a little something about the extended mind debate. I won't say much about it. Just that the issue here is you know, it's actually about the machinery of cognition. So I don't think it's really a debate about contents. It's a debate about the machinery underlying those contents. So I think the claim is really as if someone said, you know, your calculator's mechanisms aren't all in the laptop. You know, sometimes that's true, sometimes it isn't. It's, um, you know, if you were using a web-based calculator, then it would be false to say that your calculator's mechanisms are all inside your laptop. And I think we're fairly comfortable with that sort, of, that sort of idea. So the main idea of the extended mind is just that the mechanisms of mind might bleed into the world in just the sort of way that the mechanisms of calculation could bleed into the web. No, in a way we shouldn't have problems with that as an in-principle possibility. There are two arguments that I want to draw attention to here. The first one people have spoken about already, so I'm not going to spend any time on it. The sort of functional poise argument, kind of Otto Inger argument. What I will talk about is uh, motor informational weaves. So functional poise, just to get it out of the way, that's the Otto Inger thing. The idea was um, suppose some bioexternal thing poises information for use in the same kind of way as biological memory normally does, well maybe then we should count the poison of that information as if it was already encoded in your biological memory. That's kind of how the uh, kind of how Otto Inger stuff goes. And I won't bother with it. So there's several things saying I'm not going to bother with it, and I'm not. Okay. This other thing that I will bother with is temporal weave. So I think this is the thing that's going to apply, apply a lot to the sort of entangled cases that we really do run across on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is a, a sort of issue that I associate very much with the work of Susan Hurley, who of course sadly died a few years ago. But the idea is that we shouldn't think of intelligent activity on something like an input cognition output model. It's not just, as it were, that all the cognition happens in here, stuff comes in, motor stuff goes out. Instead, I think, um, what, what Susan and others wanted to say is, look, that doesn't do justice to the way in which we really are entangled with all the stuff that's going on in the world around us. So what can we say about this sort of entanglement? I think 
One of the important things about this kind of picture of entanglement is that our exchanges with the world aren't clogged. It's not that, as it were, the brain does something and then at the next instant stuff comes into the world, then at the next instant the brain does something again. Kind of idea, I think, in this sort of temporal weave thing, is that the brain's doing all kinds of stuff all the time and some of those sub-things can make calls to the world and the world can, if you like, send information back. So it's not clocked in that sense. It's not that there's a, a neat time step at which you go to the world. That seems to me to be important. And it's tied up with this other thing, that that means that our exchanges with the world don't have to pass through a kind of bottleneck of conscious attention. So it's not the case that, as it were, moment by moment, I'm kind of thinking, oh, I need that bit of information from the world, let's go and get it. It's a much more complicated kind of interwoven story. And you see this in a, a lot of skilled performance. So, you know, uh, think of someone flying, a, flying a, a, an old-fashioned uh, fighter jet. You know, maybe it's not so true for modern ones. Um, there's a picture of an old-fashioned fighter jet, cockpit, you know. Uh, in a cockpit like that, the, the fighter jet pilot is making repeated calls to these uh, little sort of bits of externally encoded information, etc. Um, the way in which the pilot circards around that instrument panel rather famously uh, has very little to do with the way that the pilot thinks that they circard around that instrument panel. So people used to think, you know, they were taught a certain way to do this in fighter pilot school. Um, a finding many years ago was that they thought they were still doing it that way, that's the right way to do it, but in fact they're doing some other kind of thing entirely, circarding around the instruments in a way that is really good for fighter pilot performance. Okay. So what's important about these sorts of cases to me is that the brain's not required to explicitly represent that such and such information is available from such and such an external resource at such and such a moment. Instead, I think what happens is, in skilled performance, once we become skilled fighter pilots or skilled users of software packages, um, your performance just kind of assumes the easy availability of such and such a cognitive transfer, sorry, such and such an information transformation or such and such a piece of information that's relevant to what you're trying to do um, by a quick saccade or whatever it may be. So the kind of thought that I want here is that this is a sort of habit loop. So our calls to the external world here are being, are being incorporated into these really complicated habit loops that don't pass through a serial bottleneck of attention and they're not neatly clogged. That's the kind of temporal weave consideration that I want to put on the table. And you can think about uh, other kinds of more familiar weave. You know, if, you're, if you detect a sudden flash and your eyes automatically saccade to where that flash of light was or that, um, you know, or you orient towards a loud sound, then there's a kind of unrepresented commitment, if you like, in that motor informational weave to the effect that useful information might be available from that location at that moment. So it's not that that is represented anywhere in the head. That's the kind of thing Dan Dennett will want to stress. This doesn't need to be represented. It's what he would call a free-floating rationale. OK. So the kind of thought there is that there's a lot of this motor informational weave going on. That um, when, we, when we use external tools and technologies to, to kind of further our cognitive ends, we're often interwoven with the stuff that those um, that those tools and technologies make available in this sort of way, in ways that don't require us to represent what we can get and when we can get it. We just kind of come to, to use this stuff. So this is entanglement. The idea of entanglement is there's not a neat little sphere of internally achieved computation with a well-behaved coping that calls to the world. It's a much wormier, more entangled mess than that. Lots of little neural subroutines that each have the ability to call different actions where those actions might generate different little bits of information from the world. Okay. So it's important, and everyone will notice, that <coughs> entanglement doesn't force you to be an extended mind theorist. You know, you can have all kinds of entanglement and not care at all about the extended mind. And I actually think that people like Tim Williamson that uh, Zoe was talking about yesterday or more recently I heard Richard Holton giving a talk like this, they might very well think there's an awful lot of entanglement, um, but they might draw the line at thinking about minds as extended. Still, where there's entanglement, you can't factor things very neatly into, as it were, the, the bit that the brain does and the bit that the rest of the world does. That neat factor in has been sort of blocked by, by the sort of worminess of this motor informational weave. 
Okay, so that's the background. What I want to do now is suggest that this, this, this sort of motor informational weave, there, there, there could be a kind of issue here. Let's see if I can get it on the table. Okay. So suppose it's the case, I think it is the case, that entanglement is actually quite important as part of the cognitive scientific motivation for believing in the extended mind. I don't think it's sufficient, um, but I think it is sort of part of the background story. Suggests this sort of dense intermingling that makes it hard to sort of separate out the different contributions in this web. Then I think there might be an issue, and now we're going to uh, start quoting Duncan for a little while. Um, so, you know, Duncan's views sort of, you know, the more, the, the more you probe Duncan's views, the more reasonable they seem. So I'll start with the sort of less reasonable bits, and then we'll get to more reasonable bits. Uh, so here's something Duncan said. A feature that is critical to the Otto case is that Otto has self-consciously decided to extend his cognitive process. Aware that his non-extended memory is failing, this is a means by which he ensures he can still get access to the information. He also says, Otto's acquisition of the notebook and systematic use of it represents epistemic virtue on his part. The ways in which Otto emplo employs the notebook reflect his epistemic virtue. Lesser agents wouldn't be as, as careful as Otto seems to have been to set the whole thing up, keep the notebook sort of um, uh, around when needed, etc. And maybe most revealingly this comment, because this is one that I just don't agree with. In contrast, if Otto had no awareness at all of the source of the reliability of his belief forming processes, nor that it was reliable, then it's hard to see why we would now regard the true beliefs that he forms as, as a consequence, as knowledge. So, so that's a claim that I want to disagree with. I'm not persuaded by that claim. I think it demands too much, but also, more importantly maybe to, to me, I think it threatens to undermine uh, the picture of cognitive extension that, uh, that I want to try and defend a little bit. You might think, of course, that, uh, that, that this demands just the right amount, in which case I think you should think it's inimical to some of the arguments about cognitive extension. Okay, so, I think what's causing the trouble here is that as soon as you ask Otto to take any kind of deliberate epistemic care regarding his notebook, that immediately makes the notebook start to look more like the kind of external equipment that Otto isn't fully interwoven with, if you like. It makes it look like the kind of external equipment which you're consciously encountering and need to kind of take care of. Not like the sort of external equipment that has become um, deeply and automatically woven into your routines in this sort of way. So at a minimum, I think, as far as extended mind or even entangled cognition arguments go, it shouldn't make any difference whether Otto is or ever was aware of the source of the reliability of the notebook involving process. I don't see why that should matter. An invisible notebook that intervenes like the reliable demon that someone was invoking yesterday, I think, would do just as well once it was suitably woven in, if you like. So this is a dilemma that I wanted to get on the table early on here, that it seems to me that the more the notebook figures in what you could think of as active attempts at epistemic hygiene, the less it looks like it's just functioning as part and parcel of Otto's cognitive processing. Um, imagine that every time you try to use your brain, as it were, uh, it's sort of turned up in your, in your, in your sort of um, cognitive horizons as something that you might kind of take care about. That, you know, that's not, at least that's very far from uh, what we normally think of as the, the fluent role that cognitive machinery should play in generating actions of an individual. What it does, I think, is it makes the stuff that you're encountering look like an external resource. It's external stuff that typically we take care of in this sort of way. <coughs> so we could be a bit more realistic here. It's very likely that real world Otto does see the notebook at some point, does think about the notebook at some point. So they might go through the sort of stage that, uh, that Duncan was requiring there, this stage of active, aware reflection. But I think we should agree that going through a stage like that shouldn't be essential. You may not have gone through that stage with regard to your own brain, ever. And if you remained locked in a stage like that, I think it would just look a bit weird then as a, as a real case of cognitive extension. It works against the resources woven in, in this kind of automatic, lots and lots of subpersonal calls to the resource, weaving stuff into a single, a single kind of um, strategy. 
So whatever else might be right or wrong with reliabilism, it does, it, it's got a much easier ride here. You know? The notebook, even if it's used without any efforts at any time at epistemic hygiene on the part of the agent, could in fact be a reliable way of forming and deploying true beliefs. So, you know, a simple reliabilist has an easier ride here. So there's a dilemma, at least as far as I can uh, nail it. Otto must either continue consciously to encounter the notebook as an object for virtuous, epistemically hygienic practice or not. If Otto does, that makes the notebook look more like external equipment. It could then be a source of knowledge, but it would fail to count as part of Otto. But if he does encounter it in that way, continue to encounter it in that way, then it looks unable, given the basic tenets of virtue epistemology, to act as a source of knowledge. So I think there's a kind of problem there. Okay. Now I need to uh, back off very slightly and say something about cognitive integration and predictive processing. So, so Duncan sort of backs off of this almost immediately just a little bit. That's what I mean about Duncan's views getting more and more reasonable the, the deeper you read into the papers, but they get weaker and weaker. <laughs> so, uh, um, so Duncan immediately worries that the demands he's just placed on Otto would be too stringent if they were placed on normal biological systems for memory and perception. So, for example, we accept the testimony of our senses without being aware of the underlying processes or even why they're reliable. Okay, so on the face of it, I thought, okay, that's a surprising concession from someone in virtue epistemology. For what's, what's left now, apart from simple reliability? Well, there is something left. There's this slightly mysterious thing that keeps coming up. Integration with the cognitive character of an agent. So this is what's now going to do the work. So that's what I want to look at. Um, what Duncan says here is that equipment present since birth doesn't need to be subjected to these kinds of demands of cognitive hygiene. Sorry, I meant epistemic hygiene. So a child can use her perceptual abilities to gain knowledge of the surroundings, even if she's not aware of the source of the reliability of her eyes, her ears, whatever. Or think of an agent fitted from birth with some kind of non-biological system that delivers reliable information. That'd just be like the stuff you're born with, you know. You've got plenty of time for this to become integrated in your cognitive character. So why? So why is why do we have these sort of, sort of different views here? Duncan has a very different take on the case where something suddenly changes. He says, okay, um, the onboard equipment already counts towards someone's cognitive character, even though you haven't taken any reflective stance on it or on its epistemic standing. But if you were suddenly fitted with something new, this would cry out for you to take a reflective stance on the epistemic standing of the change. Imagine an agent fitted with something at a later stage, we would then require that agent to form a view as to the reliability of this process and the source of this reliability before we would regard the process as knowledge conducive. That seems to me to, that, that threatens to cause a problem. Okay. Okay. So let's think about a non-human animal fitted late in life with a prosthetic eye that delivers useful information by being sensitive to some novel wavelength of light. Seems to me that non-human animal could come to rely on that device, integrating it fully, without in any substantial sense taking a view on its reliability. So there's a sort of issue here, what is it to take a view on the reliability of something? I think I have a, a conception of taking a view that is so weak, it doesn't involve taking a view at all. No, I'm not trying. <laughs> but of course it's possible that Duncan agrees with this, it gets a little bit weaker again. So Duncan says, that new and unexamined capacities could be weakly integrated just in case their deliverance is a subject to a kind of consistency check. Meaning that um, the agent would respond to discrepancies were they to occur, discrepancies with the rest of what their cognitive equipment is delivering to. He also suggests that an agent unknowingly augmented by some device would, assuming that condition is met, count as having integrated the device into their cognitive character. So at that point, it's not clear to me what's left of virtue epistemology. The active pursuit of epistemic hygiene seems to have been dropped here. Weak integration only requires that the deliverances of this new bit of kit are subject to a kind of um, consistency check with other stuff. But that consistency check could happen entirely automatically. There's no need for the, the agent, as a deliberative agent, to run a consistency check here. And it does seem to me that that sort of integration is 
routinely achieved without a genetic involvement at all. And that's a tiny sidestep into predictive processing that I want to, to take here. It would be a whole different talk if I talked about predictive processing. This is the kind of idea that brains are in the process of trying to predict their own ongoing streams of sensory stimulation. Turns out that's a pretty cool, useful thing to do if you're a brain. Enables you to build up an interesting kind of um, model of the world outside. What really matters, though, for our purposes, is a, a second bit of that kind of story, which is that the whole sort of processing economy on those models is modulated by a further factor, which is the automatic precision weighting of a key bit of that equipment. The key bit is the weighting given to a particular prediction error signals, but that doesn't matter for our purposes. What really matters is that this weighting is achieved automatically according to the re reliability in problem-solving contexts of different sources of information. That's what's going to do the work here. So what variable precision weighting does is it sort of it turns up the volume on some of the neural equipment um, according to uh, estimated context. So in some context, some bits of neural processing will have more effect on other bits of neural processing than they would in other contexts. So you can think of, for example, stuff like integrating information from sight and sound when you hear speech. Famous stuff like the McGurk effect, where, as it were, what you, um, under that circumstance, what you hear is warped in the direction of what you see. So, you know, you see my lips form a particular kind of shape, and you hear either bar or par according to that shape, even when the actual auditory signal might be entirely the same. So the kind of thought there is that your brain is sort of varying according to context. Which bits of the, the overall processing economy get to bear the most weight at a given time? And that's because those variations have kind of proven useful in, um, in driving the kinds of behavior and discrimination that you as an agent need to make on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Okay. So, suppose that we, we sort of keep that half in mind and then have a look at the templates. So, this came up last in the, in the last talk too. Temp forms temperature beliefs by consulting a thermometer. But a hidden agent adjusts the room temperature to match that of a malfunctioning thermometer. Pritchard concludes that Temp does not know the temperature of the room, and the reason is that the reliability of these um, beliefs does not reflect his cognitive ability, but merely the helpful assistance of the hidden helper. Doesn't seem to matter, Duncan claims, whether the source of that deviant reliability is on board, maybe it was an implant, or whether it was the, the typical off-board case, you know, the hidden helper. What seems to matter is that um, if it was this invisible on-board implant or if it was the external helper, uh, there's a sort of disconnect between the reliability of the beliefs and the cognitive character of the agent. And it's that disconnect that I think uh, might disappear at a purely subpersonal level given the pictures that, uh, that I've been trying to, to put on the table there. So let's think about this for a minute. So to improve temp situation, you could imagine a case where temp starts to spot the conditions under which his temperature beliefs become unreliable. So I'm adjusting the case here a bit. So imagine that one day a week, every Wednesday, the helper takes a break, the hidden helper. And the temp consciously notices that on Wednesdays, the thermometer is less help than it used to be. Virtue epistemologists should like this. That's like, okay, um, a sort of a, a good attitude has been taken here, and now the sort of this external stuff is being rolled into cognitive activity in a way which, uh, to which the agent can take a certain amount of credit. Kind of idea, I think. So on Wednesdays, this version of Temp doesn't trust the thermometer. That meets a kind of weak virtue condition, I think. But there's an even weaker virtue condition that I think any predictive processing system would have a chance of meeting here. So think about temp two. Temp two is a predictive processing agent full of these subpersonal mechanisms that estimate reliability in context for various sources of information. Over time, imagine the very subtle sensory cues that you only get on Wednesdays get to be associated with um, unreliable results when you use the card in the direction of the thermometer. All of this could happen in a purely sort of subpersonal weave kind of way. So subpersonal precision weighting mechanisms then cause temp2, even when she looks at the thermometer, to fail to take any notice of what it says. It just, you just don't factor that in. Counterfactually, if things then altered, 
and the helpers started taking Tuesdays off instead of Wednesdays, the same subpersonal mechanisms could slowly update their estimations. So what's important for me here is that this subpersonal updating doesn't implicate the agent in any obvious way at all. I don't want here, by the way, to disagree with, um, with what Fred was saying about extended, uh, Ken, about extended stupidity uh, or about cycling doofus. You know, there will be lots of cases where those automatic estimation mechanisms either malfunction or the behavior is not sort of subtle enough for them to be locking on to the differences. So things can really go wrong. All I want to say is that they can go right in a way that seems to meet some of the virtue epistemology conditions without actually requiring the agent to engage things in a conscious way. And that's good if you want to weave stuff together into these sorts of holes where in encountering stuff in a conscious way would be inimical to the idea that it's part of an extended cognitive system at all. So I think Tech 2 has got a genuine but fundamental kind of epistemic hygiene. She's got unconscious metacognitive mechanisms that allow her to estimate reliability of different information sources. So, you know, you could do this with... Uh, yeah, the yeah. point is that it doesn't need to sharpen her thinking anyway. Now go back to Otto and the notebook. So it's pretty clear that nothing in Otto's notebook estimates the reliability of the notebook. You know, the notebook doesn't, whatever these estimated uh, automatic mechanisms are, they're not operating within the notebook. But the notebook is like eyes on the thermometer. It delivers a stream of information which is apt for this kind of non-conscious metacognitive assessment when it's used. So the invocation of the notebook and even the degree to which Otto relies on the information that is thus um, brought into action could be subject to all of those automatic checks and balances. So that's the way in which I think you would need to fiddle with the notebook story in order to make it um, successfully uh, both be a case of extended cognition, in my view, and meet some kind of either minimal virtue requirement or maybe it's just a kind of fancy reliability requirement. Upshot would be, Otto's brain treats a notebook loop as a high-grade information source, just as it might treat some but not all aspects of its own by memory. So, that's the kind of idea. And because all this goes on below the level of conscious engagement, that sort of worry that I had earlier just doesn't arise. Okay. Um, I used to think this was a subpersonal virtue account. Right now, I think it's just a second-order reliability account, and the right thing to say is that virtue epistemology got it wrong. But... Um, I think we'll talk about that. Okay, a um, couple of bigger fish and then I'll stop. Uh, there's a big fish about epistemic circularity around here somewhere. How long have I got that one? Yeah. You go. Uh, to speak, I mean, rather than the whole thing. You've been going about 25 minutes, half an hour, so you're actually. Oh, cool. well. Okay, I can, I can do the whole epistemic circularity thing. Okay. So here's, here's a big fish, but it takes a minute or two to get to it. Um, this is a worry that uh, Adam. Adam Carter and Jesper have raised in a manuscript called Extended Circularity, a new puzzle for extended cognition. They argue that an epistemically responsible agent must at least endorse the reliability of the resource. So, you know, you can see the kind of virtue line here. They say whatever endorses reliability has to itself be a reliable process, on pain, obviously, of undermining the authority of the endorsement. But now they, they offer a, a nice little catch-22. They say, look, Otto can't endorse the reliability of the notebook using bio-memory because by hypothesis here, bio-memory has become unreliable. That's why Otto is using the notebook. So they want to say, okay, that wouldn't be a reliable way of endorsing the reliability of the notebook. But you can't use the notebook to endorse the reliability of the notebook because that would be circular. You know, suppose you wrote in the notebook, this is a reliable notebook. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's not really going to do the trick. So they think to appeal to the deliverances of the notebook to justify the appeal to the notebook will be circular. And there's a, a sort of catch-22. I think we can escape this in a way that sort of fits together with the earlier stuff. What's failing in Otto is episodic memory. But failing episodic memory is consistent with preserved semantic memory. So Otto still knows, for example, what a knife is, how to use a knife, semantic memory kind of stuff. It's also consistent with preservation of all that subpersonal precision weighting stuff as it's used for, um, for supporting um, fluent, uh, fluent engagements, if you like, sort of um, acting in the world. So there's a suggestion. 
I think Otto's brain could still learn to assign high reliability to action guiding cycles that involve a notebook. That doesn't mean relying on failing episodic memory for anything. There's no episodic um, content here. Doesn't rely on any specific thing encoded in the notebook. And this is all because using the notebook is a skill. It's about this motor, it's about weaving the notebook in, in this sort of um, complex, subpersonal, motor informational way. So I think it falls into the domain of what might plausibly be preserved in Otto, which is a kind of semantic, pragmatic competence. That would mean there's no circularity here. Rationally and non-circularly endorsing the resource as reliable is now nothing more than integrating it into habitual action-guiding routines, but they meet this very minimal condition because they're policed by all these sub-personal estimations of, of reliability. So if things do start to go wrong, things will get altered. So I think this is quite a big fish because there are some real-world cases that are right on the doorstep here. So if there was anything knowledge non-conducive here, I think this would be really bad news for cases in which folk really do come to rely very heavily on the use of external resources like this. So here's a few of my favourites. Here's Patrick Jones, um, a working deacon in Colorado Springs who kept falling off his mountain bike, basically, repeatedly, um, to the point where he ended up with the sort of memory deficit that you saw in the, in the movie Memento. So, you know, he, he just doesn't lay down new, new memories. Um, but he lives a surprisingly normal life as a working deacon in Colorado Springs, and he does this by relying on lots of fairly ordinary tech. Um, popular software Evernote, a Mac program called Curio, an iPhone. This little lump of off-the-shelf stuff allows him to create massive webs of interlinked notes and pointers, um, which allow him to diagram his own contacts, thoughts, meetings, decisions, interactions. That's how he comes to... to be able to be a working passive deacon. It's only in virtue of all that web of structure that he can recall who he's spoken with, you know, what was decided, all that sort of stuff. So Patrick's episodic memory is now built, it seems to me, of both biological and non-biological resources. I think that's the right thing to say. It seems to me that, you know, if you were to fiddle with those resources, you're interfering with his mind. It would be, as Dan Dennett said, like inflicting brain damage on someone. And there's loads of cases like this now. There's another one, David Dory, has amnesia following the, a brain aneurysm, can't lay down new personal memories, but he can very slowly acquire new skills. He uses an iPod to keep a grip on what he's doing, when and why, and says, without it, I wouldn't know where to go or what to do. It would feel like I was floating. So he was a harder case than, the, um, than Patrick Jones, because Patrick Jones was very practically skilled with the use of all these technologies beforehand. So it was very easy for him to transition into a into this sort of extended um, support setup, whereas Dory had no experience at all beforehand. So it was really, I mean, to be honest, it was like training a chimp. It was, it was, you know, you just had to go through cycle after cycle after cycle of training to get the to get the resource pr appropriately interwoven. So they're, they're different cases in an interesting way. Yeah, Twenty years ago, people like that were placed in twenty-four-seven care. So it's kind of sobering to reflect on that. I think. What I want to suggest is that regardless of what anyone thinks about the extended mind story, I think it's a minimal constraint on a good epistemological view that it should deliver the verdict that Jones and Dory are entitled to rely upon their webs of external structure and that those webs enable them to know stuff that they otherwise wouldn't. So I don't know, I'm not quite sure what the right solution is, but I think there must be one, otherwise we'd get the wrong result with regard to people like that. One way or another, the circularity is that... Um, that Carter and Callistrup fear have to be avoided or, or, or made less threatening. Second big fish, um, limits of the extended mind. So these ways of accommodating these cases rely upon well-functioning subpersonal mechanisms of reliability estimation. Yes, you know, you get the virtue here because if things started to go wrong, um, you might start to rely less on stuff, I think. You might think that's a very big concession to some kind of cognitive internalism, and I'm not sure that it is. Um, I think at most it shows that some bits of good bio-internal functioning might be necessary. And, um, you know, it's really no great surprise that some bits of good bio-internal functioning turn out to be necessary for, um, uh, for good cognitive contact with the world, at least as things currently stand. 
It's also unclear what the prospects might be for repairing or outsourcing reliability estimation. Maybe we can do a lot of that. So maybe in the end, you know, if you've got internal, uh, those internal mechanisms don't work, maybe we can outsource reliability estimation itself. Um, that's something to think about. And the last big fish, um, reflective agentive epistemic care, why bother? Um, yeah, so you, know, you might think, given all of that built-in subpersonal epistemic hygiene, this um, automatic estimation of the reliability of different sources of information, so you know, what's left for conscious reflective agentive engagement to do? I can think of a few things I'll just mention, and then we can talk about it. So, First benefit, I think, is something like ultra-rapid reliability estimation. So suppose this is actually true. I'm a big fan of Apple product, products. I'm a fan because they always work for me. Now Apple will release a brand new device. It's a Google Glass that spots Celtic versus Rangers fans. So a great survival value. Um, it does this by comparing current camera images to pictures stored in social media. Um, that's, that's doable. Um, Okay, so I think as a reflective agent with a history with Apple, I'm entitled to rely from the very outset on what that device does. But I don't think a non-reflective agent suddenly fitted with that device would, from the very outset, be entitled to rely on it. There might be a sort of a distinction there. Compare, unknown to me, I'm fitted during my sleep with a device like that. Maybe with an implant that delivers a little subconscious threshold buzz on my left if it's a, if it's a, a Rangers fan on my right for Celtic. That makes it more like, I think, a sudden mutation. You know, I, I, wake, I wake up and I have, I have access to this information. It will take a while before I even know what the information is that I'm accessing, but over time it will probably happen. Um, but still, the first time that, that this works for me, I don't think I'm entitled to rely upon the signals that it delivers. I think that does take time. Whereas in the previous case, I think just because it's got the Apple logo on it and I'm a reflective agent, I am entitled to rely on it. So that seems to make a difference. Another obvious benefit is that reflective agents can deliberately engineer the worlds that they live in. So you can deliberately engineer the environment so that it's more friendly to you. That seems important. Everything from simple signposting to, to spreadsheets that don't let you commit certain kinds of error could get folded in there. Also, training children to probe and test their own sources of information. This is all kind of deliberately engineering um, friendlier, friendlier worlds and friendlier selves. And lastly, of course, reflective agents can engage in rapid bouts of systematic coherence monitoring and repair. If a number that comes up on my calculator looks way out of line with my own rough estimate, I can ask a question that I don't think an unreflective agent could ask, which is, is the device faulty or did I enter the wrong information? That question I don't think is available unless you're a reflective agent. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of the pure predictive process in animal with automated processes of reliability estimation could end up rejecting one of the estimates rather than the other because they assign higher reliability to, let's say, what the calculator says. But they couldn't ask that question, um, what exactly went wrong in that case. So you couldn't ask which resource was at fault and why. So there's a close analogue here for sports skills. Only reflective agents can ask which bit of my current performance is to blame when things go wrong. So that seems like, you know, it's not like reflection is not going to have uh, any role to play. Okay, last question and then I'll stop. It's a, I think this sort of picture raises an interesting question for designers, which is something like, um, if you're designing new tools and technologies, then how can, how can you design them so as to encourage the use of reflective epistemic care insofar as it can help, but at the same time encourage the rapid, easy incorporation of these things into cycles of behavior where they become pretty well invisible in use. So I think that's challenging. Um, I'm not quite sure what the right thing to say is. Um, one thing that we could say, I think, is that the more the technology becomes invisible, and I think that is a, a way that technology is moving, it should become less and less stuff that we encounter, more and more stuff that just uh, fluently contributes to how we encounter the world. If the tech then becomes invisible like that, that makes it more like our own biological equipment. That's good for the extended mind. Uh, what I think that then lets us, makes us want to do with regard to uh, sort of reflective engineering is it will become more like medical health. You would want a modicum of individual education about how this invisible stuff is working. Very little, but just enough. 
to know when to call in the specialists and, uh, and as it were, get things fixed. So it would be very much like sort of knowing just enough about your own bio systems to spot some of the telltale signs when things are going wrong and then seek medical help because, I don't know, oh, I think I might be developing Alzheimer's or, or something like that. Okay, so that's everything really. Um, conclusions. This is what I've tried to argue in a slightly rambling way. Strong and even moderate versions of virtue epistemology I think what they're demanding is the kind of uh, sort of vigilant contact with your, with your tools and devices uh, that makes them look very much like external knowledge sources. I think the more you demand vigilant contact, the less it's going to look like um, an ordinary part of you. The good news for the extended mind story is that we ought to demand of something for it to be mind extending and knowledge conducive. Will it be subject to any kind of agentive scrutiny whatsoever? So I think these minimal kinds of automatic reliability estimation give you the most that you could reasonably require. So, you know, that's the thought. Maybe it's not such a bitter pill after all. The sweetener is when minds like ours encounter the world, they do so using subpersonal mechanisms that have got a lot of built in hygiene. So um, that's basically good enough for me. That's the end. Thank you.